Previously, we have discussed various shrinkage, denoising, and detoning techniques. And now let's take a look how they are in, implemented in Portfolio lab, Library. So let's start with the dual wolf shrinkage. So here in uh, Portfolio Lab, we have a module, uh, we have a class name which is called Risk Estimators, which basically implements all the methods we have previously discussed. So if we take a look at uh, Ledois Wolf Shrinkage, we can see that it is implemented in Portfolio Lab under a class which is called Risk Estimators. So what it does, it has a, a static function which is called Shrinked Covariance, which takes returns as inputs. Um, which uh, also has a type of shrinkage which can be uh, used. So here it can be either basic by the default. If you want to use the Lidua Wolf um, uh, shrinkage uh, technique, you should pass LW uh, as, uh, as input. Uh, you can also uh, use the basic shrinkage. So if you use a basic shrinkage, you, you can also you should also specify the alpha shrinkage parameter in basic shrinkage uh, value. So that's how um, Ledois Wolf shrinkage can be used to estimate uh, the denoised uh, covariance matrix. And now let's take a look how denoising and detoning techniques, which were proposed by Marcos Lopez de Prado, are implemented in risk estimators class. So here we can see that they are still implemented under risk estimator uh, parameter, but here uh, there is one function for both denoising and detoning. So what it does, it takes your covariance matrix as input. It also takes TN relation. So TN, if we take a look at the documentation, is a relation of sample length T, which is uh, used to estimate the covariance. So if, for example, you use latest 20 days, your T big value equals to 20. And N is the number of assets in your covariance matrix. So T and relation basically measures the relation of number of data points to number of columns in your covariance matrix. We also can see that we have uh, the denoise method. Uh, so it can be either constant residual eigenvalues or tar target shrinkage. In the lecture series, we have discussed constant residual eigenvalues method. Uh, also, we can specify if we would like to detone our covariance matrix, meaning that we will uh, remove market component uh, out of the covariance matrix. And as we have also discussed, um, that for detoning, uh, usually first principal component uh, of covariance matrix, um, uh, first principal component of covariance matrix decomposition uh, is responsible for market component. So that's why uh, it, um, this parameter shows the number of first eigenvectors which are related to a market component. And the default value is one because usually the market component is the first, uh, is the first principal component or the first eigenvector of covariance matrix. But if, for example, you have some specific data set or specific type of problem you, you, you are solving, and several um, market component or several eigenvectors uh, correspond to a market component, you can specify that in market component uh, parameter value. See, here we can also see the kernel density bandwidth. So as you have remember, in denoising the covariance matrix, we fit Marsenko Pasteur uh, distribution. And uh, for fitting this distribution on the second step, we first need to uh, fit a kernel density estimator. And basically, uh, the, band, the bandwidth of this kernel density estimator is, um, um, is the input of the algorithm. So what is the bandwidth of kernel density estimator? <clears throat> so when you try to fit empirical density function, which is basically kernel density function, um, the numerical process is such that you <clears throat> split your data um, into various small uh, uh, small chunks and fit uh, your kernel density on top of that. And the bandwidth corresponds to how granular, how granular is your uh, split. So by lowering the uh, kernel density bandwidth, it will take very small chunks uh, of uh, 
uh, very small splits of the data and fit kernel density on top of that. If you would like to have a higher uh, values, in this case, it will uh, split it into bigger um, uh, chunks and fit kernel density on top of that. So uh, I would suggest not to use too high values because in this case, your kernel density estimator won't fit very well. Um, so just don't try to make it them too big um, for for the data. And the final value the final value is um, alpha. So instead of uh, if you use constant residual, um, if if you use target shrinkage instead of constant re residual uh, eigenvectors method, you need to specify the uh, target shrinkage uh, alpha parameter. So here. If you, uh, if in your denoise method you choose target shrink, uh, you should specify alpha, which basically means the level of uh, shrinkage which you um, which you would like to use. So um, that's how you uh, can denoise and detone your mat uh, covariance mat uh, matrix. If you would like to om omit detoning, which is a default value for this function, you should specify that detone equals to false. But if you'd like to both denoise and detone your matrix, just use uh, detone equals to true in this case. So we have discussed how to use um, Portfolio Lab to uh, improve our covariance matrix. But still, there is a problem that Pearson correlation is not the best way to capture uh, nonlinear dependence between two variables. And here is a small toy example for that. <clears throat> so let's take a look at several dependencies which are well known to um, anyone who dealt with, um, I would say, ba basic math, right? So here we are, we, on the first plot, we can see linear dependence, which is basically y equals to x plus uh, some uh, white noise. The second one is a square dependence, meaning that y equals to x squared plus some random noise. And the second one, y equals to the absolute value of x, uh, which is the absolute um, dependence between these two. So if we measure Pearson correlation, it shows 99% uh, uh, correlation value, which is basically uh, the main purpose of Pearson correlation. So it is also called linear Pearson correlation because, because it measures linear interdependency between two variables. But if we take a look at the second plot, we can see that the Pearson, Pearson correlation value is just 0 0.11, <clears throat> which is very small. So um, if you take a look at the Pearson correlation of 0 0.11, you would probably say that there is no correlation between two, these two variables. But actually, there is a very strong dependence between these two, but it is just nonlinear. <clears throat> if we take a look at y equals to a module of x, we can see that Pearson correlation says that there is absolutely no dependence between these two variables. But actually, we do know that it exists be because we designed y and x in the same way that there is a strong and clear functional dependence between these two. So how can we solve these type of problems? Actually, there are several dependence matrix which are uh, usually used in um, uh, in uh, information theory, which are called uh, normalized mutual information and information variation. So, if we take a look at these three plots, we can see that these two matrix uh, uh, are quite uh, good in capturing the dependent structure. So if we take a look at linear dependence, we can see that normalized mutual information and information variation still say that there is a dependence between these two variables. But if we take a look at squared um, plot, they manage to capture and say that there is a very strong dependence between these two variables, despite the fact that Pearson correlation uh, does not, um, uh, Pearson correlation uh, does not capture that. And the same applies to a absolute dependence. In this case, Pearson correlation says that two variables are absolutely independent, but normalized mutual information and information variation say the contrary, because there is a strong uh, dependence between these two. So in a ML lab pa package, 
uh, we have implemented both these metrics in our um, dependence module. So you can use them to build not, so as a result, you can use to, uh, not only Pearson correlation to build dependence matrices, but you can also use information variation and normalized mutual information to build those. But now let's jump into the next technique, which is a uh, great combination of both discretionary and quantitative view on covariance matrix, which is called theory implied correlation matrix. So <clears throat> a problem of empirical correlation matrices is that they are purely observationary and do not impose a structural view of the investment universe supported by economic theory. So the thing is that sometimes the researcher or discretionary trader or portfolio manager already has a view on actually what kind of clusters and actually how the um, um, so how assets are uh, dependent between each other. So for example, we uh, can use GICS uh, global uh, sector uh, breakdown and of course uh, companies which are present in 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 one sector uh, will definitely be extremely correlated because they are exposed to the same set of uh, risk factors. But sometimes our covariance matrices may say that there is a either zero or negative correlation between these, these two companies, just because as we have previously discussed, measuring covariance matrices uh, suffers from a problem that the number of data points used to estimate is much lower sometimes uh, comparing to number of assets for which this uh, dependence is measured. So it would be great to somehow incorporate both um, discretionary view on the dependence between two assets and a quantitative view uh, on the dependence. So that's actually what theory applied correlation matrix uh, is doing. So the theory implied algorithm is aiming to estimate a forward looking correlation matrix based on economic theory. So probably you have an economic forecast saying that, for example, uh, several companies inside of a some kind of um, industry group will become very correlated, uh, which can create uh, various um, opportunities to trade or for example, you just have the economic view on how actually the dependence between assets should look like. So the method is using a theoretical classification of assets like hierarchical structure and fits the empirical correlation matrix to the theoretical structure. So basically um, this algorithm combines both quantitative view on dependence between two assets and uh, theoretical view which can be based on some economic theory, uh, global industry classification, or even uh, some fundamental factors. So TIC algorithm is described in a paper, estimation of theory implied correlation matrices, which was written by Marcos Lopez de Prado. So let's take a look at the, steep, at the steps of this algorithm. And after that, take a look at the implementation in Portfolio Lab. So, on the first step of the algorithm, the theoretical trigger of structure of assets is fit on the evidence presented by the empirical correlation matrix. So um, further in our documentation, we take a look how to create a theoretical uh, trigger of structure, but now, now, uh, but now let's just take, take a look at the algorithm. So if there is no top level of the tree, which is called tree root, this level is added so that all variables are included in one general cluster. The empirical correlation matrix is transformed into a matrix of distances. And that's actually a very important step, which we will further see in uh, hierarchical risk parity and hierarchical risk contribution. Because if we take a look at the correlation matrix as itself, it does not have uh, many uh, good properties which can be used in uh, quantitative finance. But distance matrix does. So there is a uh, set of um, modifications 
of transformation of a correlation matrix, which can be applied to uh, your uh, to your correlation matrix to make a distance matrix. So usually you can use uh, Euclidean, uh, which is also uh, you can use a, uh, angular distance uh, modification. You can use absolute uh, angular distance mod modification, or you can use squared angular distance. So here we use the angular distance modification to a correlation matrix. So after that, for each level of the tree, the elements are grouped by elements from the higher level. The algorithm iterates from the lowest to the highest level of the tree. After that, a linkage object is created for these grouped elements based on the distance matrix. So let's stop at this point. So what is linkage uh, object? Actually, uh, uh, in the clustering uh, world, there is a set of uh, algorithm which is called hierarchical uh, clustering, or um, some of the researchers use agglomerative clustering. And actually, what um, are those um, all uh, algorithms are about is to create a linkage object which creates a dendrogram of assets and uh, uh, puts them into clusters. And the key part of that is a linkage object. Actually, we have several ways how to create the linkage object. We can use uh, SciPy uh, linkage library, and uh, you can you can use either, uh, for example, Word, uh, single, uh, sigma, or complete linkage algorithm. So after that, a linkage object is transformed to reflect the previously created clusters, and it it is added to a global linkage. So basically on this step, we start combining the theoretical view and the quantitative view on correlation matrix. So after that, the distance matrix is adjusted to the newly created clusters. Elements that are now in the new clusters are replaced by the clusters in the distance matrix. So on this step, what we do, we have theoretical matrix, have we have a correlation matrix, we um, uh, transform them into distance objects. We have created linkages and actually we start to uh, basically um, blend these two views so to create a one structured view of the correlation matrix. So um, the correlation matrix is derived from the linkage object. So uh, one by one, the clusters, each represented by a link in the linkage objects are decomposed to lists of atoms contained in each of the uh, two elements of the cluster. So the elements on the main diagonal of the clustering correlation matrix are set to ones because uh, in correlation matrix, that's uh, the value for the diagonal element. So the off diagonal correlation between the variables are computed as uh, the formula on the screen. And after that, the correlation matrix can be denoised or detoned. So here, if we take a look at this, um, if we take a look at this formula, this is the uh, inverse formula for transposing uh, correlation matrix into, uh, into distance matrix. So when we take the absolute angular distance matrix out of a correlation matrix, we find the square, the square root uh, of my, one minus, uh, minus rho. So when we want to go to get the uh, inverse uh, transformation, we use this formula. So now let's take a look at the, the uh, theory implied correlation matrix to uh, understand how it is implemented in MLT lab. So let's take a look at theory implied correlation matrix. So here, for example, you can take a look how to use MSCI uh, global interest classification standard, which is GICS. So that's actually our theoretical and fundamental view on how actually uh, your assets should be grouped into clusters based on industry group. So here for each asset, we create a row which, which corresponds to it some sub-industry code, industry code, industry group code, and sector code. So here, as you can see, uh, so the uh, AUN equity corresponds to a sector of 35, uh, the industry group uh, 3520, 
uh, after that we go deeper so the uh, industry is 35 20 30 and the sum with receive value is 35 20 30 and 10. so that's actually how you can <clears throat> create a uh, theory implied correlation mate uh, theory applied view on how your uh, assets should be clustered um, based on your uh, fundamental uh, view on the clustering of those assets. So as you can see here, that is the formula of how do we convert our correlation matrix into distance matrix. And that's this distance is actually called angular distance. So we can, we can see that we take a square root of one divided by two uh, of uh, multiplied by one minus correlation. So if we would like to measure the formula of converting distance matrix into correlation matrix, we'll get the inverse, um, we'll get the, we'll use the inverse formula. So we will, if we uh, square both these two parts, multiply them by two, we can get the latest formula from, from the slide we have previously saw. So we use here a uh, SciPy linkage function. So the algorithm uh, is also explained in details in Portfolio Labs documentation. So now let's take a look at the example of um, how actual theory applied correlation matrix is used. So we use from Portfolio Lab estimators, we, imp we import theory implied correlation. We use our tree classification, which is in our case GICS uh, global uh, classification standard. Uh, so that's our fundamental view on how actually assets should be divided into clusters. We of course use stock returns to measure the empirical correlation matrix. After that, we find the correlation matrix. We find the TN relation, which is used further to denoise our correlation matrix. Here we initialize the theory implied algorithm. And after that, we just pass uh, our tree classification uh, object, our correlation matrix, our TN, rela uh, TN relation, and uh, kernel density bandwidth, which will be used in our denoising uh, procedure. So uh, in uh, MLFIN labs, in portfolio labs implementation, uh, it is, it is um, uh, so the, on the final step of the algorithm, uh, the, ma the matrix will be denoised. So as we have previously discussed, uh, KDE bandwidth is the bandwidth which is used in uh, denoising uh, algorithm uh, of uh, constant residual eigenvalue. And after that, uh, when we created the TIC matrix, uh, we can calculate the distance between the empirical and theory implied correlation matrices. So this theory implied correlation matrix, which can be, uh, can be used in your um, optimization tasks, in, it can be even used in mean variance optimization. And uh, as sometimes uh, actually by design, theory implied correlation are, correlations are forward looking, you can get the edge of combining your fo forward looking fundamental view and your quantitative view on correlations into one blended object to optimize your portfolio. So here you can see the example uh, from the documentation of uh, how we uh, create, can create three classification object. And now let's start discussing the machine learning type of algorithms which are, uh, which are designed to tackle the problem of Markowitz curves and add the hierarchical, hierarchical view on our um, asset clusters. And we will start from a, an algorithm which is called nested clustered optimization or NCO. Uh, 